Hello and welcome to The Edge, where we'll take an in-depth analysis of today's top stories by looking beyond the edge. We'll bring you not just the facts, but also deep insights into the topics with expert opinions and social media reactions. Let's make a start with our look beyond the edge. U.S. President Joe Biden has defended his decision to withdraw military forces from Afghanistan, now saying that U.S. operations will end on the 31st of August. The fourth U.S. president to oversee the war also defended the speed of the U.S. withdrawal, saying that it saved lives. However, Biden's speech comes as the Taliban continues to seize territory around the country. Is the Afghan government capable of holding power without U.S. support? The United States rebuked the Israeli army demolition of the family home of a Palestinian-American man. The U.S. embassy has stated that it is following reports of the home demolition and that all sides should refrain from unilateral steps that exacerbate tensions and undercut efforts to advance a negotiated two-state solution, which certainly includes the punitive demolition of Palestinian homes. Can the illegal demolitions by Israeli forces be stopped? And the Delta variant is quickly becoming the dominant strain of coronavirus around the world, with outbreaks reported in several countries. Studies have shown that the Delta variant spreads approximately 225% faster than the original strain of the virus. Studies have also shown that once a person catches the Delta variant, they likely become infectious sooner, and the virus grows more rapidly inside a person's respiratory tract. What do experts know about the Delta variants? So these are the top three stories that we'll be taking a look at today from Beyond the Edge. Let's get started. The withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan plays an important factor in the Afghan peace process. Our infographic gives an overview of the U.S. troops' presence in Afghanistan. As the U.S. military continues to wrap up its mission ahead of its September deadline, despite concerns about renewed conflict, U.S. President Joe Biden says it is up to the Afghan people alone to decide how they run their country. Our military mission in Afghanistan will conclude on August 31st. U.S. President Joe Biden said on Thursday that U.S. troops are to complete their withdrawal from Afghanistan by the end of August, despite the advance of the Taliban. Last week, U.S. troops already left Bahram, which had been their largest base. On Tuesday, the U.S. Pentagon said that U.S. forces had completed more than 90 percent of their withdrawal process. President Biden also expressed confidence in the Afghan military and said that a Taliban takeover of the country is not inevitable. We did not go to Afghanistan to nation build. And it's the right and the responsibility of Afghan people alone to decide their future and how they want to run their country. Together with our NATO allies and partners, we have trained and equipped 
over three, or nearly 300,000 current serving members of the military, the Afghan National Security Force, and many beyond that who are no longer serving. The Taliban on Thursday seized another key Afghan border crossings, this time with Iran. It was the third border crossing the insurgents have taken in the past week, after previously seizing crossings with Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. The Taliban winds have caused some countries to close their consulates in the region, while Tajikistan has called up reservists to reinforce that country's southern border with Afghanistan. The Taliban now control roughly a third of all 421 districts and district centers in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, a delegation of the Taliban visited Moscow on Thursday to offer assurances that their quick gains on the ground in Afghanistan do not threaten Russia or its allies in Central Asia. Russian officials have expressed concern that the Taliban surge could destabilize the ex-Soviet Central Asian nations north of Afghanistan. The U.S. is not just withdrawing troops from Afghanistan. They are effectively admitting the failure of their 20-year mission. The terror threat has not declined, just the opposite. It has grown many times bigger since 2001, when the Americans entered the country. Moscow, which fought a 10-year war in Afghanistan that ended with Soviet troops' withdrawal in 1989, has made a diplomatic comeback as a mediator, reaching out to feuding Afghan factions as it had jockeyed with the U.S. for influence in the country. And I'm now joined live from Sofia in Bulgaria by Ruslan Trad, who's an out security analyst. Ruslan, thank you for joining us today here on The Edge. Thank you very much for the invitation. So, Russell, since we last spoke, um, the, um, the withdrawal date of U.S. troops was scheduled for the, for the, um, for the 11th of September, 9-11. Um, and yesterday, Joe Biden has pulled it forward to the 31st of August. What is the significance of this? And is there anything to be read into the, the timing of the announcement? Well, the media uh, already um, made a good summary of what's happening right now in Afghanistan. But uh, the situation on the ground is developing uh, even now while we are talk talking right now. And the Taliban forces are concentrated uh, in the mostly northern and western part of the country. And actually, they already uh, control two or three two thirty of uh, border with Tajikistan. It was confirmed not only from Russia but uh, from ground sources. So the the withdrawal of uh, American forces is already have very serious consequences on the ground. And we are seeing uh, mobilization of uh, local militias and pro government forces in different parts of the country. And uh, the, um, the, the, many of the government forces have, uh, in the, uh, the last week, they've fled out of the country into Tajikistan. So is the, um, uh, uh, is the, the, the Taliban gaining a real stronghold now? Or, uh, as suggested, is this just a temporary setback? Oh, no, no. Uh, I, we, we should understand that this very serious situation. Uh, the Taliban uh, leadership are making very uh, visible to understand everyone that they want to rule the country one day. Maybe will be not till the end of this year, but they have a serious um, intention to gain more and more control over the territory in Afghanistan. And currently, every... Um, or almost every of the biggest strategic uh, uh, cities in, uh, in uh, Afghanistan is under siege by their forces. So this is a very important moment for the Afghanistan. It's a very terrible development, uh, of course, uh, not least because the whole, um, the whole reason that the United States went in uh, in the first place was to, to stop um, sources of terrorism within Afghanistan to stop, um, uh, to, to prevent those groups from then later um, projecting themselves on, onto U.S. territory and harming uh, U.S. citizens. Ha has this withdrawal by the, uh, by the U.S. Uh, totally set back um, what they initially 
um, set out to accomplish? Can you say that uh, this uh, withdrawal of forces by United States uh, have two big consequences in geopolitical meaning? Uh, on the first side is um, what uh, Biden said about uh, the terrorist uh, uh, activity, which is not harmful to United States uh, at this moment. This is uh, not so true if we are speaking in an analytical way. Uh, the Taliban leadership uh, have very clear links to al-Qaeda forces, not only in Afghanistan, but in the region, including in Pakistan and Central Asia and India. So Afghanistan is very important to al-Qaeda to deploy uh, more operative forces on the ground and to establish more stable bases there. Uh, withdrawal of uh, United States forces is uh, good news for al-Qaeda. Uh, for sure, the Taliban wants to present them as an uh, uh, important player and uh, legitimate actor, but they have clear links to al-Qaeda, including um, confirmed by the latest uh, uh, United States Army and United Nations report. On the second uh, side is the vacuum um, left by this withdrawal of forces. We saw that... Uh, United States forces uh, uh, very rushly uh, were in, in this uh, withdrawal, and uh, including some of the bases were left uh, empty with all uh, vehicles uh, left aside. So uh, this uh, geopolitical vacuum will be uh, dangerous and for the American interest, because we saw uh, Russians are trying to fill this vacuum uh, Turkey and uh, China, Pakistan, Iranian. Uh, Iranian side actually is uh, very, uh, very active right, right now. They they already met uh, Taliban for a few times just for few for the past uh, two weeks. Now, um, Joe Biden's words that we're not there, we didn't go there to nation build. Uh, is the right and responsibility of the Afghan people to determine <laughs> yes. how they want to be yes. governed? Is, is that selling them out? I think this is uh, this is a hypocrisy because uh, we know that uh, situation in Afghanistan is uh, is really uh, worrying not only for the region but also for European Union which leaders are uh, uh, monitoring the situation very closely. This is a bad situation also for Central Asia. And most important, this is a very serious situation for Afghan people. Mm -hmm. uh, for the 40 years, these people are living in war. Even, uh, even today, uh, in, in Kabul, with the capital, the situation with security is very worrying. So, uh, I don't understand this uh, statement by Mr. Biden about uh, the fate in the hands of uh, Afghan people. They, they have no choice to decide. Right. Well, it's a very difficult situation. Um, obviously, we will see where it goes from here. Russ Antrad, thank you so much for joining us today here on The Edge. Thank you. Uh, the Taliban has ceased attacks on Western forces but continues to target the Afghan government and security installations as it makes rapid territorial gains across the country. In just one week, the Taliban has overrun areas bordering countries including Tajikistan, Uzbekistan and now Iran, while the situation in Afghanistan has also been deteriorating. We truly hope that all the attacks will stop in order to prevent more casualties. Now let's move from Afghanistan to another crisis-driven region, namely Palestine. Since the 1970s, discussions have been held to find a solution to the never-ending Palestinian-Israeli tensions. What proposals have been put forward? Our infographic explains.
Another home has been added to the long list of illegal demolitions carried out by the Israeli forces in occupied Jerusalem. Israeli occupation forces blew up the home of Palestinian prisoner Montasar Shalabi in the Turmuz Ayal village north of Ramallah on Thursday. Israeli troops leveled the two-story home of Montasar Shalabi with controlled explosions. Israeli security forces arrested Montasar and accused him of carrying out a drive-by shooting on the 2nd of May that killed an Israeli and wounded two others in the occupied West Bank. The United States has rebuked the Israeli army demolition of Shalabi's family home. The U.S. Embassy in a statement said that, quote, as we stated numerous times, the home of an entire family should not be demolished for the actions of one individual. The case has yet again drawn attention to Israel's policy of punitive demolitions of the homes of Palestinians who attacked Israelis. Israeli officials say the demolitions deter future attacks. While rights groups view them as a form of collective punishment, the U.S. State Department has urged a halt to punitive home demolitions. And I'm joined live from Jerusalem by Moab Khateb, who's a Palestinian activist. Moab, thank you so much for joining us here today on The Edge. Again, another atrocity to, uh, to discuss in Palestine, Palestine against uh, Palestinians. Well, what can you tell us about the, the latest situation of the home of uh, Montessor Salabi? Uh, well, this is, thanks for having me. Uh, this is nothing new, actually. It's not news anymore. Uh, this demolition of houses, of homes, of Palestinian homes, particularly, uh, has been ongoing for decades now. Uh, this is nothing new. Uh, obviously, uh, not only that it is crime against humanity, but also it is even, it, it doesn't even make sense to punish a whole family for uh, the mistake uh, of, of one individual. Um, so, but that's the policy of, of Israel towards Palestinians. It, it seeks uh, reasons and uh, um, justifications to continue in its policy in oppression in uh, this, the destruction of homes, the annexation of land, uh, the murder of innocent civilians, and, you know, given that nobody is, is, is holding Israel accountable, it just continues doing what it's doing. This particular case, uh, I totally agree with you. In a sense, the, the event of a house being demolished uh, it, it, it is ongoing situation. What's different here, perhaps, from the perspective of the international, of the international view? Um, uh, sadly, it takes um, a, a dual national to, to bring headlines uh, very often. But the United States has uh, finally made a uh, criticism of this demolition. How important is that? Um, you know, it's really ironic. It, it saddens us to see, um, you know, that the United States was all the time turning a blind eye to the destruction of homes, to the murder of civilians. But now, only because this particular Palestinian civilian is also an American citizen, uh, now suddenly the United States woke up and uh, condemned the demolition of, of, of his house, as if Palestinian lives do, don't matter, as if uh, their lives are worthless, unless they are also American. Uh, you know. The United States has been supporting Israel, both in terms of economy, in terms of um, weapons, and, of course, diplomatically, in blocking uh, moves in the United Nations that aim at uh, holding Israel accountable, forcing it to stop mm -hmm. you know, its crimes against Palestinians. So it, it doesn't really make me uh, uh, cheer or, or you know, happy to hear such news, because it, it just uh, further reaffirms the fact that the international community is, you know, doesn't care about Palestinians. The, the, you know, the, the so-called human rights are apparently exclusive to certain humans. Palestinians are not among them. Can we, can we just open the, the, um, the, the discussion a bit to, to help people understand uh, the, the general situation? Um, just... It's just a few months ago, the, the, we, the world was focused on Sheikh Jarrah and, and Al-Aqsa Mosque. But Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, there were very many demolition orders that, uh, and the Supreme Court uh, delayed its ruling on those. 
those I think uh, are still waiting for a final verdict. But what what is the in, what is the situation in Sheikh Jarrah? How are people living there? What are the oppressions against them? What is daily life like for them? Well, um, it's important to stress here that while demolition of houses in Sheikh Jarrah didn't begin yet, uh, the destruction of homes inside Jerusalem, in Silwan, which is you know just a mm -hmm. few minutes far from Sheikh Jarrah, has been ongoing uh, in the past few days. Uh, houses were demolished, uh, stores, stores, uh, and even you know farm uh, barns uh, for, for you know uh, raising animals have also been uh, demolished by Israel. Now in Sheikh Jarrah, it's not different. It's just delayed, like you said. Israel, you know, uh, does things in a smart way. When whenever there are you know um, uh, protests and the the media is covering the the events in Sheikh Jarrah. Israel, you know, just suspends uh, those decisions, delays them, but does not cancel them. So it's only a matter of time, to be honest with you. Uh, they are waiting for the street to get calm or to get busy with, you know, something else, because Palestine is really burning everywhere uh, because of the occupation and its policies and its oppression. Um, so they, they just, you know, wait for um, the media lens to, to, to look a different way, and then they will start, you know, the destruction. Um, I am not being pessimistic, but I mean historically th that's what what uh, what has been happening. Um, so, you know, I, I'm really worried that tomorrow just another family would woke up uh, to uh, beat on on their doors, asking them to leave their homes before they uh, set up uh, detonation devices in their houses before they destroy it, like we saw in Montasa Shalabi's home. And then to add insult for injury, once the house has been demolished, I believe that the people are expected to pay for it. Yeah, unless you destroy it yourself. So you, you get two options. I mean, Israel is very generous, which, which should really be thankful. Uh, they offer you two choices. Either you destroy your own house with your own hands, or you actually pay for the bulldozers that come and destroy you, 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 your, your home, your memories, uh, your, ch your children's future. So it, it, it's really tragic. You know, just imagine having spent your life, your entire life, you and your children and your brother, your whole entire family, um, to build this house, to shelter your family, and then you are forced to destroy it. Because if you don't, they will come and destroy it and force you to pay the expenses, which reaches around $80,000, US dollars. Uh, of course, they inflate the expenses of, of the demolition. So just imagine you, you, you're looking at, at your future, you're looking at your past, you're looking at your present, your children's future, and you are, you're seeing it being destroyed. And then actually they arrest you if you just, you know, out of anger, uh, just rush to protect whatever you can. Uh, they will arrest you, they will beat you. Uh, like, you know, that, that's what we, see, what we saw in, in during the destruction of, of that home in Silwan just a few days ago. Mm -hmm. So you can't, nobody can really imagine how difficult it is, how tragic it is to live under the occupation, except for Palestinians. And uh, as part of that, uh, the, the, obviously, uh, as, as we discussed, Sheikh Jarrah still hasn't been acted on, but um, the protests that were happening in that neighborhood, the Palestinians weren't, uh, were basically trapped inside their neighborhood, I believe. Whilst the, um, whilst the Israelis were able to come, freely come and go, the people of the community uh, were basically trapped inside. Can you explain to us what that situation is about? Exactly. You know, uh, when Israel realized that uh, the, you know, the issue of, of the case of Jeff Jarrah is enjoying an unprecedented international media coverage, uh, they decided that they will block the entry, the entry of, of activists, whether Palestinians or foreigners, Westerners, uh, media, journalists, we saw a lot of footage uh, of them actually uh, harassing and attacking uh, journalists and cameramen. Um, and then they blocked the entire neighborhood. Uh, they only allowed Jewish settlers to come in, to, in, in solidarity and to support uh, the invaders who occupied uh, a few of the, of the homes. Uh, whereas Palestinians, actually, the, 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 the residents of the neighborhood, the Palestinian residents of the, of the neighborhood, uh, occasionally prevented 
access to to the to the to the houses uh, for you know a lot of different uh, silly reasons. Um, so currently things are calm not because uh, Israel just stopped doing what it's doing, but because there's no media coverage because they're allowing no one to enter or, or, uh, to to go in or out of the neighborhood. So a very terrible situation. But well, you hope that, um, that sooner rather than later the United States. Uh, fully opens its eyes and not just tries to protect uh, U.S. Palestinian citizens, but all Palestinians. Um, Moab, thank you so much for joining us today here on The Edge. Uh, it's a terrible situation and our hearts are with you. Thank you. Palestinians in occupied Jerusalem face approximately 33,000 demolition decisions, while the occupation government allows the construction of tens of thousands of settlement units. A long-running campaign by Jewish settlers to expel Palestinians from their homes still continues. It seems as if violence against Palestinians will continue, but we still hope that the reaction from the international community might stop atrocities against them. For now, let's move on to our final topic to speak about the fast-spreading Delta variant of COVID-19. COVID-19 variants bring new difficulties and uncertainties in the fight against the pandemic. Our following infographic has more. New study by a group of scientists has confirmed that the Delta variant is the most contagious strain of the coronavirus worldwide. After months of data collection, scientists agree the Delta variant is the most contagious version of the coronavirus worldwide. It spreads about 225% faster than the original version of the virus, and it's currently dominating the outbreak in the United States. A new study published online Wednesday sheds light on why it finds that the variant grows more rapidly inside people's respiratory tracts and to much higher levels. Researchers at the Guangdong Provincial Center for Disease Control and Prevention reported. On average, people infected with the Delta variant had about 1,000 times more copies of the virus in their respiratory tracts than those infected with the original strain of the coronavirus. After someone catches the Delta variant, the person likely becomes infectious sooner on average. It took about four days for the Delta variant to reach detectable levels inside a person, compared with six days for the original coronavirus variant. Their findings suggest that people who have contracted the Delta variant are likely spreading the virus earlier in the course of their infection. And to discuss the latest about the Delta variant, I'm joined live from Sussex in England by Dr. Zeki Ateshli, who's a consultant in emergency medicine at East Sussex Healthcare NHS Trust. Dr. Ateshli, um, let me congratulate you a few days late for the 73rd anniversary of the National Health Service in England. Uh, um, it's a monument, monumental time. The, what can you tell us about the latest information we gleaned on the Delta variant of COVID-19? Uh, good evening, Andy. Yeah, as we, uh, you said in uh, your uh, presentation, uh, we know now that Delta variant is more infectious, more uh, transmissible and more causing more severe uh, COVID-19 uh, illness. And um, it has started in, uh, in the UK roughly like beginning of April. We were discussing about this variant which was discovered in India originally. And now we 
are basically where we, we what we expected that the numbers would increase, and um, that's what's happening at the moment. So, um, what particularly about this uh, about this variant makes it makes it unique? Um, it's the, the the numbers um seem uh, fairly astonishing the the um the, the very fact that it can start um start incubating and um that somebody is infectious sooner seems incredibly worrying yeah and unfortunately like in any other viral illnesses we can get mutations they are much more uh, dangerous and that's the case with the delta variant and it is um, definitely like more than 60% more and easier transmissible. It reduces the efficacy of uh, vaccinations. Just the good news is that the study shows that uh, when, if, you, if someone had two jobs or fully vaccinated, that the protection against hospitalization and severe illnesses reduces significantly. Uh, like in, according to some research, is going between 85 up to 95 percent. Mm. This is the only basically uh, the good news about that. Apart from that, Delta virus is unfortunately very dangerous. When we think uh, when it will spread throughout the world, and in the UK, is that is, it is main. Um, strain, more than 90% is Delta variant. In Europe, it's spreading, and it is also spreading worldwide. And if their vaccination status is not very good, obviously, it may cause uh, lots of uh, damage. There was some uh, maybe concerning news, um, at least for us laymen, uh, from Pfizer-BioNTech the other day that said that they, their vaccines weren't quite as effective against the Delta variant as, uh, as they are against the, the other variants. Uh, does, does that actually mean that the vaccines aren't working? Or, um, or, or, or you know, what, is, uh, what, what is the news about vaccines and this variant? The vaccine, the key issue, key defence seems to be to be fully vaccinated, meaning at least like two uh, vaccination or two jabs. One jab doesn't protect that well, it goes between, according to research or studies, like as low as 10% up to maybe, in the best cases, up to 60%. And that makes it obviously very dangerous. And in the United, or in England, or in the United Kingdom, we have got about 85% of the population, other population, has been uh, vaccinated with one dose and 65% with two doses. Despite that, we are worried. When I think, obviously, about other countries, they're further behind with their vaccination, mm -hmm. but the Delta variant yeah, is high risk. Uh, and that's obviously, as a healthcare professional, it is very worrying to watch. On the other hand, we have got a new um, health secretary, uh, Sajid Javid, and the tone has changed and the mood has changed. The government is asking us now to start to learn to live with this virus. We can't go on anymore like this because of the vaccination reduces the risk of hospital hospitalization and severe illnesses. And uh, despite the high numbers, we uh, the numbers today are over 35,000 new cases and 29 deaths. In, uh, in, uh, in the United Kingdom, there are worrying signs, but government is saying we need to reopen the economy and we need to start uh, living normally. And um, uh, that's basically accepted by the government. Uh -huh. uh, the health secretary mentioned it, even we could have up to 100,000 new cases at the peak times. And, uh, of course, he warned that there, there would, of course, be, be more deaths. But it's, everything in life is about finding the right balance of things. And, and countries around the world, including Turkey, are beginning to try and find a, a new normal. Um, and, and this is perfectly normal. Now, the, the worrying thing, of course, is that there are many countries. We, um, of course, Haiti is in the news at the moment because of the, um, 
uh, be because of a recent assassination of his president. But Haiti is one of the countries that hasn't had any vaccines yet. Many parts of Africa, large, most of Africa, has seen either none or very few vaccines. Does this suggest that there could be um, other, maybe even worse variants yet to come? Yeah, you're completely really right. Uh, and that's the worry for uh, scientists or for us, healthcare professionals, that, you know, big, with increasing numbers of um, new cases, there is a higher risk of for new mutations. There is no doubt there will be new mutations. We can just hope and pray to say they won't be more dangerous than Delta or as we are. And it is really worrying when we think that if Delta variant spreads out throughout the world, and um, when we see, you mentioned Haiti there, but there are countries like, when I read about Brazil, is it a huge country with huge yes. population, is also very far in behind with vaccinations. Or even when I hear about Australia, they have vaccinated their 8 or 10 percent of their population, despite they are trying to deal with it in different ways by locking down them completely and isolating them from the rest of the world. But uh, we are not a good, uh, at a good place. And in England, we are seem to be a little bit better, and I'm following what's happening in Turkey. As a medical professional, I'll experience that vaccination is at the moment key factor. Because when I think back in January, when we had peak times, that was unbelievable, unprecedented. I've never experienced something like in my professional life or 30, 40 years. But with start of vaccination, everything is almost like uh, so uh, reduced that was unbelievable. Therefore, vac vaccination is the main weapon in our, in our hands. And uh, the other thing is obviously the treatment is um, getting better. We know better about the virus and hopefully we will be able to deal with it. But this Delta variant is, is a major concern at the moment. Well, that's good. So although we still see cases, uh, it, it, uh, we're used to looking at the numbers, and although we still see um, large numbers of cases around the world, the actual impact on the, on the health sector isn't as, uh, uh, isn't as catastrophic as, as it would have been had the vaccines not been in place. That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah you're right. Uh, and basically, two vaccinations, uh, you need to be fully vaccinated in order to have, like, between 85 to 95 percent, well, like, the numbers are between 65 to say 95, and um, Pfizer seems to be more um, effective or protective than AstraZeneca to some um, studies. But you need to be fully vaccinated. Apart from that, we are at risk uh, to become more ill and uh, more like an infectious to others. Now, alongside the vaccinations, um, what, what else do people need to be aware of? Obviously, uh, right at the moment, this weekend in England, everyone's very excited. They're all out going to be out to watch the football together uh, on Sunday. Uh, people are doing uh, normal summer activities or hoping to get out and about more. W apart from making sure you're having the vaccinations, bearing in mind that there are children, young people, um, and others who haven't had the, uh, the vaccine that you might come across. What precautions should people still be taking? Yeah, as, as usual, uh, the, uh, we are just making a for, for face, uh, like in a face covering, like in a mask, is a key issue in closed areas. I definitely won't continue with that. It's obviously difficult to do, like if you're in a restaurant or in a pub, when people are in crowded places where they're shouting or screaming and celebrating, that um, is obviously uh, less likely. I think I'm uh, pretty certain that all these activities around the Europe uh, Football Championship uh, contributed to uh, spreading of Delta variant because there was traveling a lot mm. between lots of European countries up to Azerbaijan and Baku. And, um, and then people had to travel or fly uh, thousands of miles. Th that definitely contributed to that, I think. And I would just... Uh, the, like, new symptoms of... The, this Delta variant has got the different symptoms than the so-called Alpha variant. Is the headache and sore throat or runny nose. 
is more, it feels like more common cold. Obviously, in summer, common cold is not uh, expected, and people have to be really uh, vigilant. If they think they have got some sort of cold, they have to take uh, precaution. And imme immedi immediately and so seek medical help. First of all, let's hope that... Um, Let's, let's hope that England win on Sunday, but let's also hope that people celebrate responsibly and uh, cover their mouths whilst they're, whilst they're cheering. Dr. Atesi, thank you so much for joining us today uh, here on The Edge and taking your valuable time. Thank you. Now, uh, as rising coronavirus infections force some countries to reimpose restrictions, studies show that the leading vaccines still offer strong protection against severe disease and hospitalisation. Now, our analysts have provided their insights on today's top stories. Let's have a roundup of what they had to say. Before closing our programme, let's take a look at social media to hear your voices and reactions on today's top story, shared with the hashtag FreePalestine. And here's what you had to say about Free Palestine on Twitter. Khatija says destruction of Palestinian villages continue as Israeli occupation forces destroyed Palestinian prisoner Montessa al Shalabi's house in Trumus, a village occupied Palestine. Khalid al Sabi said the violent occupation regime blew up the home of the political prisoner. Montese Shalabi in Tunus Aya village earlier this morning. Israel is ethnically cleansing Palestinians from the river to the sea. And Anfar says the demolition of Palestinian homes and livelihoods is the most direct trigger of forced displacement with grave humanitarian impacts. Israel must be held accountable for these violations. Please write urgently to your elected representatives and ask them to call for justice. Let's now take a look at our video of the day, which tells the history of Palestinians who are witnessing horror every day. <laughs> Palestine, 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 Palestine,
سوف تنتصر والقدس لا تحمل هويتين إما نحن أو نحن هذه الميادين فيما بيننا حكم وسوف يدري الأعادي أينا الجالي أودت ذخائرهم إلا فوارغها فالآن يوفون مثقالا بمثقال شعب يسير برايات ملونة لدولة وقفت بالأكدر البالي And that's all for this episode of The Edge with me, Andy Boyne. Stay tuned as we'll be back next time with more in-depth analysis on the top stories and a look beyond the edge.